Sabbaths. Good morning. Happy Sabbath to everyone. Good to see you. I think some of us are a little bit sleepy here today. That's okay. That's okay. You know what? Where two or three are gathered, right? It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Uh, I did have a little bit of announcements. Oh, looks like we're not quite there yet. I'm jumping the gun here. Okay. All right, so it is time for news and announcements uh, so that everyone is aware of um, family life and what's going on. Oh, thank you very much. Appreciate it. All right. Let's see. Okay, so as you know, it's tax time uh, and you need important papers, right? So make sure. Uh, that you uh, grab your tax receipt. It should be either either talk to Carlos if he's around or uh, take a look in the lobby. I think they still have the setup table uh, for you to go ahead and grab that. All right, we are announcing uh, for the Pathfinders an all-you-can-eat pancake breakfast. Uh, it is a fundraiser. Uh, as you know, uh, Wyoming is coming up pretty soon. And so uh, they are diligently uh, doing their best to raise funds uh, to be able to go, right, to Camp Arim. And so if you want to support them, uh, please stop by. It is at the, let's see, College Park Church? Uh, no, uh, at the elementary school, sorry. And it's $20 per person, 45 per family, and then you'll see more details in the newsletter, so please take a look there uh, for more information. All right, so we are up on some ministry. Uh, there's a ministry convention coming up uh, in March, right? So it's coming up pretty fast. Uh, the early, if they've extended the early bird sign up. Um, when you go and sign up outside of the early bird time, it's going to be $90, I believe, $95. And so they're, extend, they're extending the early bird. Uh, through this weekend, so please make sure if you're interested in going and uh, getting some training on ministries and things like that. Uh, connecting, networking is a very important part of these as well. Uh, now's the time, 75 bucks, and you're in. There is some paper information, brochures in the back welcome desk, so please, uh, if you'd rather see a piece of paper uh, as opposed to a digital screen, right? Uh, please feel free to, to grab one of the flyers from the back. As you know, March 1st is uh, a really exciting day. We're going to be launching the Hope Channel. Uh, so please take a look uh, and support. Please tell your friends as well. There's going to be lots of content uh, for us to share and to, and to be uplifted, right? Here's a quick video. Hello, friends. For the last several weeks, I've shared with you that a new hope is coming to Canada. Well, the time has come. Beginning this coming Friday, Hope Channel Canada officially launches with distinctly Canadian content along with beloved shows from Hope Channel International and other Hope Channels. Hope Channel Canada will share with our country that there is more to life and it can be found in Jesus. In this video series, we've covered the many different programs Hope Channel Canada will offer. There will be something for everyone, and I mean everyone. There will be programs for families, youth, and children, programs in French, in English, Portuguese, Tagalog, Ukrainian, Hindi, and more. 
will share inspirational news from across Canada. And our many church ministries will share their mission and stories. We'll offer training in personal evangelism and practical outreach opportunities. This truly will be a new hope for Canada. And we cannot do it without you. In each video, I've invited you to become an agent of hope. But you might ask, what is an agent of hope? Well, it's someone who is committed to sharing the hope we have in Jesus. It's someone who supports our church's efforts to share this good news with Canadians, whoever they are and wherever they are. It's someone who yearns for their neighbors to know that there is more to life and it can be found in Jesus. As an agent of hope, your dedicated support empowers the ministry of Hope Channel Canada and the diverse media ministries under its umbrella. So I invite you today to join us as an agent of hope. Together, we can share with Canadians that there is more to life and that they can find it in Jesus. Be exciting, huh? Uh, to be able to have our very own stuff, and we can broadcast and uh, and share the gospel. Amen. All right. So let's see. Uh, yeah. So there's a QR code if you're looking for the newsletter and get that information on your mobile device. Uh, we're trying to save uh, trees as much as we can, you know, because they're important for the environment. Uh, I just wanted to mention a couple of things as well. Uh, one is uh, we got the sad news that uh, Margie Parkinson passed away February 16th. Uh, for those of you that may have, uh, may have known her, um, we are mourning with the family. And uh, if you're watching, uh, please know that you are in our prayers. And finally, I want to invite all of our uh, visitors, right? Uh, we want to make sure we connect. In a church this big, uh, sometimes you kind of get lost in the shuffle. You know, it's easy to sneak in and sneak out and feel like nobody really noticed, but we want to notice. We want to make sure that we connect with you. Uh, so we're going to start something today. Uh, we will invite all our guests, uh, all our visitors to come uh, to the front of the church. We have a little gift for you. We want to connect with you, uh, at least uh, see your face and greet you personally. Uh, so please uh, stay behind for a couple of minutes. Uh, we're calling it seven minutes or less. So if you like, you can time us to see if we're going to actually uh, abide by that. We're going to try our best. Uh, but we just want to make sure we connect. We, want, we don't want you to just feel like you came to church and no one noticed, right? And so please let us know uh, how, you, uh, you know, how you'd like to connect with us. Uh, you know, we're not going to try to sell you any kind of uh, audio books or like programs or uh, health foods or anything. We just want to meet you. We want to know who you are and, uh, and welcome you to our church. So uh, God bless and uh, have a great Sabbath.
Amen, you bet. That was beautiful. Thank you, Caroline. So, well, good morning and happy Sabbath. It's my pleasure to welcome you all, those who came even with that cold weather, those who are watching online and our people from Pioneer Apartment and our visitors. Can I see some hands of visitors? I saw three. Wow, I, I see four, five. Welcome, special welcome to them, and please remember to come at the end of the service at my left here to uh, receive your gift so we can uh, really tell you that we are pleased that you came. The call for worship this morning is coming from a book that I'm reading. Uh, probably some know that person, Bill Liversidge. He was twice the guest speaker at the Maritime Camp meeting uh, some years ago. Unfortunately, he went to rest, and he sang like that. God is glorified in the life of his children as they reveal Christ, so that the world around them see Jesus in their life and in the life of his followers. And the world then sees that God loves them the disciple and he will draw those people near to him. Isn't that beautiful? The privilege we have to reveal Christ and by our, his action in our life God can attract them to him. Let's have a word of prayer. Please stand and remain, stand, re, remain standing because we will have the opening hymn with Wayne after the prayer. Father in heaven, it's a privilege to call you Father because you love us so much. We never estimate enough what you provide on Calvary. What, did you, what kind of life Jesus lives down here. But we know one thing, that your promise is sure and your word is the truth. And when we hide the truth in our heart. You come and live with us and you protect us from the evil. Thank you for being so kind and thank you for the great gift of Jesus Christ on Calvary. In his name we pray. Amen. Please remain standing. Wayne will come. Good morning, everybody. You know, the, you know it, it's doing outside. There is sunshine. We should be singing, there is sunshine in my soul today, but we're not. We're going to 15. My maker and my king.
now. Do you know what it is? It is children's time. It's your time. So come on up here, and we've got a, a story to tell you. Hello, hello. Time is it. Is it children's story? Please come. Hooray! I like it. I'm so excited. Before I tell it, I'm so excited. Are you excited too? Please come, come, come. Nice. Please hurry up, please hurry up. Thank you, thank you. Ooh, friends, how are you? How are you? How was this week? It was good? Yes, I know it was good. Listen, look at me. All of you, look at me. I have a nice story to tell you. Wow, it's a wonderful story. Friends, this is a story that I'm going to tell you. I like it. I have so many stories, but this one is the best. Why? Let me tell you. One day, Jesus has been working hard, very hard, doing so many uh, miracles around, healing people, um, chasing away the demons, and then he feels very tired. He said, oh, let me take um, a vacation, let me take time and go on the other side of the sea, which name is Galilee. And then the disciples decided to go with Jesus because they, they loved Jesus. They loved what he did before. He said, oh, you are not going to leave us behind, we are going together. So they took that vacation together so the disciples were very, very, very happy. They were talking like you are talking in between among you. And they were joking, laughing, doing everything they want. And suddenly, in the middle of the sea, oh my God, a very strong wind came. And it started to do what? To shake the boat. It, the boat was started to shake right and left, and the water started to get into the boat. Oh my God, it was very, very scary. It was scary. <laughs> you know what? That time, Jesus was snoring. He was asleep. <sighs> but others were saying, what is going on? How come this boat is going to sink? We are going to die. And Jesus is really sleepy. No, no. They decided we are going to go and wake him up. They say, Jesus, wake up, wake up, wake up. Oh, Jesus was still sleeping. He said, no, wake up. We are dying. Look, the water is going into our boat. We are going to sink. We are dying. Huh. Jesus, very calm, he stand up. Look at them. Say, you of little faith, are you afraid? Why? Why are you afraid? They say, are you not seeing that we are going to die? You know, Jesus stand up and look at the wind, say, stop. Hmm. Suddenly, the calm comes. This, the waves, the wind stop. Eh, 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 eh. This is so powerful. They look at each other, they say, who is this person? How come even the wind, even the waves can listen to, to you? Friends, is the, does wind or wave have ears? Have you ever seen wind? Can you touch the wind? Did you try to, <laughs> to touch the wind? Did you try? I 
<laughs> you, touch, you touch the wind before. But it's very hard to touch things that you can't touch. It's hard. But Jesus, they ask, how come the wind doesn't have ears, doesn't have eyes, it doesn't speak? But how come this person can do this such miracle? It's so powerful. You know what? Jesus is a powerful, very strong. He can do things beyond our imagination. He can talk only one word from Jesus can calm any situation. Amen? Friends, wind or storm is the image of the problem we can face, sudden problem. We, sometimes when we are at school and parents are not there or there is darkness somewhere, we are afraid. We are afraid of failing. We are afraid of losing our best friend. We are afraid of dying. But you know what? If you, t if you talk to Jesus, any problem you have, Jesus says, stop, and you have that calm in your heart. You have that peace. Friends, let's trust the best friend. You know, the wind were able to listen to, to Jesus because it's Jesus who created everything, including you. So whatever problem you have, whatever fear you have, talk to Jesus. The good thing, Jesus is with us. And Jesus is in the Bible. Friends, I ask you today to take time. Do you listen? to take time every single time to listen to the Bible. It's because it's where we meet our best friend, Jesus, who is the creator of the universe, who is powerful, who can resolve any problem. Who are telling me today that we commit our days to read the Bible? Who, who knows how to read the Bible here? Excellent. Even though you don't know how to read the Bible, you can ask mom and dad to read the Bible to you every single day or to pray the music that talks about Jesus. And then you will have the solution of any problem that scares you. This is my prayer today and to me in Jesus' name. Who wants to pray to us? I can pray. Thank you, Papa. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you because you are a God who have all the power in this world. Thank you because you live in our heart. Thank you because your simple word can stop any worry we have. Thank you that we are going, you are going to enable us to, to read the Bible and trust you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, girls and boys. See you another time. All right, all right. Thank you, Angelique, for the, for the wonderful reminder that we can trust the Lord, right? And he will be with us. And so, one of the ultimate ways to trust the Lord is to be faithful in returning tithe and offering. Uh, today's offering is for uh, the Ontario Advance. Uh, I'm going to ask the deacons to uh, come forward. Um, as you know, you can give online, or we do have the boxes in the back. If you, uh, if you miss one of the deacons as they pass, uh, then you could always... Uh, uh, pass it to them or, or drop it in the drop box in the back. All right, let us uh, pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your blessings. Thank you for uh, the sunshine. Thank you for reminding us that we should be, we should be happy. Um, we do pray, Lord, that you be with us today, that you uh, encourage us and strengthen us, Lord. And, and most of all, Lord, 
be our provider. We know that when we're facing storms, you are in the boat with us. And you are the one that can calm the storms. And so we have nothing to fear. And so, Lord, we want to demonstrate that we trust you, that we are all in for you by returning what belongs to you. And we pray, Lord, that whatever we put into our tithe envelope or uh, put into the offering dish, Lord, that it may go forth and accomplish that which you have designed for it. There's so many people that need to hear this message of hope. And I pray, Lord, that so many people may have the opportunity. And we are grateful, Lord, that we have the, the chance to participate, to partner up with you um, to make that happen. So bless, Lord, whatever remains in our bank accounts or in our pockets, Lord. May it also accomplish your will. And we thank you for providing for us. We thank you for your blessings. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. While the first commandment says, You shall have no other gods before me, how are those other false gods introduced into our lives? Anything that relates to our life and is not wholly surrendered to God can become a false god. The Greeks and Romans knew this very well. Everything could become a god for them. They created Hephaestus, for example, the god of work, Mammon, the god of money, Himeros, the god of sex, and so forth. We must admit that, as human beings, we are prone to be addicted to false gods. For example, working is a blessing, but when it becomes the single top priority, it becomes like the god Hephaestus in our lives. Sexuality was idealized by God before sin for the benefit of humanity. But when humans fail to follow God's established pattern and follow their own inclination instead, their sexuality becomes a false god like Himeros. Every false god that is allowed to exist before God, in place of Him, or having priority over Him, will destroy one's spiritual life. In Romans 1.25, Paul says that by following their own inclinations, some are replacing the worship of the one true Creator with the worship of creature, sometimes the worship of themselves. Paul claims that this kind of worship is based on a lie that will never make a human being truly happy. He calls this kind of mindset foolishness. It is truly foolishness to look for true happiness in things, ourselves, or other people. Only a fool looks for peace while seeking self-fulfillment or addictions. Neither true happiness can be found just in accumulating or spending financial resources. It is only in God that we are fully happy. By the way, one of the most destructive false gods is the God of greed and the unbridled pursuit of money. That's why Jesus said, No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Faithfulness and generosity are God's appointed ways to get rid of greed. When we faithfully return 10% of our income as tithe and choose another percentage for the regular return of offerings, we allow God to eradicate from our lives the false God of greed that tries to dominate us. Is any false God trying to control an aspect of your life? As you return your tithes and promise, ask God to remove it, replacing it by the indwelling of His Holy Spirit. May we put our desires last and God first. possible, let's seek the Lord and kneel in prayer. Our loving God and our Father which art in heaven, we praise you, O Lord, because great are marvelous are your work, just and true are your ways. We have come to worship that we could worship you in spirit and in truth. Thank you, Lord, for being merciful to us, 
that your mercy endures forever. And through your mercy, we are not consumed because your compassion fail not. They are new every morning, and great is your faithfulness. I pray, Lord, for your blessing upon the church, upon the children, upon our young people, and all the adults. I pray, Lord, that uh, give us wisdom to help us to live a life that is right and in accordance to your biblical principle. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us to share your love to the world. We may face some challenges, but we also know that you are with us. I pray, Lord, that give us the courage to share your good news and the wisdom to speak to those who are seeking you, Lord, and give us the gentleness that when we face that are against you, we could deal with them accordingly. Thank you, Lord, that uh, you are our God and you are our creator. I pray now for Pastor Darren that the message you have for us through him that will be truly blessed, that our faith will strengthen because our faith comes by hearing in hearing the word of God. Lord, as we leave this place, I pray that the Holy Spirit will empower us that we're ready to serve and be a blessing to those who are around us. Thank you, Lord. You hear our cry, and you're a God that delivers. Forgive none from all our sins. All these things I pray in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, the only name under heaven that man will be saved. And all the people say, Amen. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath, church. Please stand for scripture reading. The scripture reading today is taken from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. And it reads, But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here ends the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated.
Thank you, Blessing and Sasha. Jesus asked us to be salt and light, but he, like in everything, led the way, didn't he? He showed us how to do what he called and asked us to do. So good morning. Today, I think our um, Kids for Glory choir is at Kendallwood singing, so that takes away a lot of our families with younger kids. Uh, Kingsway isn't here with us today, so I think our median age has probably gone up a little bit but I'm glad that you're here, uh, whether you're old or young or whatever you consider yourself to be. I'm glad that you're here. Are you glad that you're here? <laughs> if you're happy and you know it, say amen. amen. All right. It's a good place to be. We get to come here, be together, be together with God and worship. So you have a choice. You get to choose to sing to pray, to give, to worship, to think, to study. We choose what worship is going to be for us, and I hope that you will choose, and you have been choosing, to make this a good time, a good time together. I want to say uh, thank you to the junior class for letting me out. I was visiting with them this morning, and they had a, like an escape room thing, and I only got four of the five challenges done, but they let me go so I could come and preach. So. I appreciate them doing that. I will say also, maybe this isn't the best Sabbath to say it because so many of our leaders are away, but um, I've really been impressed with our Sabbath school classes. I've visited the cradle roll and the kindergarten ones and the primary ones and the juniors so far, and we have a really, really good Sabbath school program for children. If you have kids or grandkids who aren't making it to Sabbath school, you really should because I'm um, very impressed. We have a lot of very uh, dedicated leaders who prepare every Sabbath, and a lot of fun happens down there. All right, let's get started on the sermon. We'll just pull up that first slide. So some people derive great satisfaction and pleasure from it, and yet it's a process that other people absolutely hate and dread. And I'm talking about that thing of picking teams. Picking teams, right? You know the scenario, you have two or more team captains who are standing aside, kind of apart and separate from the pool of potential players, and then one by one, you know how it goes, right? The captains, they take turns choosing who is going to be on their team. And of course, to be chosen first, that's wonderful. I mean, that just confirms your value. It shows that you have superior abilities in comparison to the, uh, the other available participants. Either that or else one of the captains is your close friend, but a uh, loyal friend to you. But even in that situation, even if it's your friend picked you because you're their friend, even in that case, it still builds up your worth because you have a loyal friend. And so as that selection process continues, what happens eventually is each person who is chosen is relieved to at least have been chosen and picked before the others who are still left standing there on the line without a team, right? Have you been there? And with each choice, those who remain unchosen, they often find their hope being replaced by a growing, sinking feeling. 
Some of you are like, I've never experienced that. And some of you are like, I know exactly what that feels like. It's that dread of being the last one left, unaccompanied or accompanied with the fear that they might not even be wanted at all. Of course, the, the ultimate cruel insult occurs when sometimes near the end of the process, one of the captains, rather than taking his last pick, he will just pass the last unwanted person to the other team. You know, have you ever seen that? Where, oh, I'll just take the rest of them. I don't want them. In other words, I got enough of what I need. I've got all the good players, so you can just have the rest. That's cruel. Have you ever been a part of that process? Being chosen can be great. Not being chosen can be brutal. And like it or not, it's part of life. It's actually often a necessary part of life. This choosing element is involved in a lot more areas of life than just picking teams for a softball game or something like that. And sometimes the way it happens is a little more subtle than that, but it still happens to us all the time. And whether that's getting a part in the play, whether it's that whole amazing and interesting world of dating, whether it's being elected as a representative, maybe getting a promotion, being nominated for a church office, just winning the door prize, whatever it is, being chosen is a factor. And the choice process can be fulfilling. The choice process can be very disappointing. But you know, the Bible talks about a very important selection situation which is extremely positive and rewarding. In fact, what makes it so great is that it involves the best thing that can possibly happen to you, and that is to be chosen first. Doesn't that sound great, being chosen first? <laughs> I think it does. That's what I want us to consider today. So let's take a look at it. We're going to go to our Bibles. And the verse I've chosen to focus on is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. So if you have a Bible, see if you can find that. If you've got a hard copy paper version, that's near the back. If you can find 2 Peter, you can find 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, but I want to begin reading at the beginning of Peter's letter here with verse 1. So look it up and let's follow along. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2, right at the beginning of his letter. This is how he started off this letter. He wrote, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. So right at the beginning of his letter, in addressing those to whom he wrote, Peter really brings into focus their status as Christians. He kind of says who they are. And he refers to them as elect, or another word we could use for that as chosen. And so in this very brief summary of the Christian experience that, that Peter has uh, really encapsulated here in verse 2, notice very clearly the God-centered context. Peter points out what God has done and what he's doing for his readers to allow them to be a part of God's chosen people. And the focus here is very firmly fixed on God. It's all about God. By introducing his letter in this way, I think Peter sets the proper tone for his readers. I don't think this is just introductory fluff. I think it has purpose. And these introductory words, they would give his readers the encouragement and the perspective that they would need as they read on with the rest of what he's going to say in his letter. So he begins by calling them elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And here's where we come to this idea of actually being chosen first. So God, who knew all about every single one of us, even before we came into existence, he specifically chose us. He chose you, he chose you, he chose you in the balcony. He chose me to belong to him, to be a part of his family. And this process of how God did that, God's choice, is explained over in Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. So go over there. If you've got access to your Bible, Romans 8, 29 and 30, and look at, look at how this works, how God chooses us. Romans chapter 8, verses 29 and 30. 
It kind of gives the steps involved. Romans 8, 29, it says, For whom he, God, foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. So, so God knew about everybody beforehand. He, he knew everything about us, including all of the problems, all of the faults that we would have, every person would have. He knew all of that information. And yet as each person that he would create came into his mind, he immediately wanted them, each person, to be on his team. And so he worked out a way for them to be able to become like him, and then he calls each one of us to come join his family, to accept his choice of us. How can we be sure that his first choice includes everyone and not just some people? There are some Christians who believe that certain people are picked and certain are not. How do we know that it's everybody? Well, we have that very important verse in John chapter 1, verse 12, that assures us that as many as received Jesus, to them he gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in his name. And there's another verse you might be familiar with, John 3, 16, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God's choice is worldwide. It's all-time inclusive. So you might be thinking, well, then, you know, if God just picks everyone first, then I'm not really that important. I'm not really that valuable to him. But I would say, oh, no, wait and stop and think about that. Think about that for a moment. Think again. Because what God's choice really means is that there is absolutely no one who is more valuable to him, more valued to him than you are. There is nobody ahead of you not a single person. There is nobody that he wants more than you. You are his first choice. You're not his second, third, or a 100 millionth. You are his top choice. Amen? That's pretty amazing. From long before you were here, God wanted you with him, and he planned for you to be on his side. Now let's go look at a, another passage, Ephesians chapter 1, where this idea is confirmed again. This is over and over in the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1. And we see that this isn't some one-off, obscure teaching of the Bible. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning at verse 4. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, and this is speaking of God the Father. And here's what it says. Ephesians 1, verse 4, it says, Just as he, God, the Father, chose us in him, Jesus, before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself according to the good pleasure of his will. And then if you move on down to verse 11, it says, in whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his good will. This is amazing. And maybe we know it so well, we're like, yeah, yeah, whatever. But it's amazing. God didn't wait for us to prove our abilities. He didn't even wait for us to maybe indicate even a little bit of a desire to join him. He didn't wait to see if we're even interested. He just went right ahead and chose us first. As it said in our scripture reading that uh, is it Joseph read for us, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13 and 14, God from the beginning chose you for salvation to which he also called you by our gospel. What a privilege to be chosen first by God. But God doesn't choose us so that we can just sit on the bench, so to speak, and as kind of some kind of unproductive member of the team. His interest in us goes much deeper than that. He doesn't just chose us so we have somewhere to be, somewhere to belong. Having chosen us with, with a full awareness, yes, of all of our limitations and our, our issues, he goes to work then to help us become truly representative members of his family. And that's what the next part of 1 Peter 1 verse 2 is about, the part that says in sanctification of the Spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit works in those who accept God's choice or call to help them to become more like him. That's what God does. 
So God's chosen people aren't just supposed, supposed to be just like whatever, they're supposed to be holy. And that's only possible through the transforming work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So God gets active in changing his chosen. God doesn't just choose you and say, whatever, stay out of my way. He chose you to change you in a good way. Talk about the ultimate personal trainer. And this corresponds with 2 Thessalonians 2.13 from our scripture reading, which connects the salvation chosen for us by God with sanctification by the Spirit. Just like in 1 Peter, those two things are together. And the same idea you find in Romans 8 that we looked at before in, in verse 29, where it speaks of being conformed to the image of his Son. The choice and the sanctification go together. And the same thing you find again where we read from Ephesians 1, verse 4, where it says that we should be holy and without blame before him. God's choice is always paired with his change of us, his helping us to become more like him. The choice always involves his work in our life in a good way. They're a package deal. They're always put together when you find them in the Bible. So returning back to 1 Peter 1, verse 2, we find that the apostle next mentions obedience. And obedience is a result of the Holy Spirit's ongoing work of sanctification in the life of God's chosen people. As they grow in holiness through the Spirit's help and guidance, obedience to God is something that just becomes more natural. It's something that happens as a part of that process of change. And then that's followed in the verse by a reference to sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Christians are maybe like, yeah, yeah, we know about that. But it sounds kind of strange, right? Sprinkling, sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. What in the world does that have to do with being among God's chosen people? What is, what is that talking about? Well, I think we find a possible background to what Peter's talking about in his letter, if we go back to Exodus chapter 24. And there we have the record of the Hebrew people entering into this covenant or this agreement with God as, their special, as his special chosen people. And so verses 7 and 8 tell of how Moses, he read to the people God's instructions recorded in the book of the covenant. So he read all of that stuff, and then the people responded by saying something quite amazing. They said, all that the Lord has said we will do and be obedient. It's a big statement. And then Moses took blood from animals that had been sacrificed. You know what he did? He sprinkled it on the people. It's kind of strange. You'd be a little worried if I just started walking down the aisles and sprinkling blood on you right now, right? You'd be like, this is my nice dress or suit. But it was an act, a ritual act that helped them remember what was going on in this covenant that they were making. And he called that blood, Moses called that blood, the blood of the covenant. And we look at the history of God's chosen people, and you read through the history, and it shows that God's people never really did a very good job of living up to their end of the agreement. Everything you said we'll do and we'll be obedient, that's what they said. What they did, didn't always live up to that. And so you read on and you get to Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34, and it tells of a new covenant that God wanted to make with his people. And this was a covenant in which his laws would be internalized into people's hearts and minds. And it's, it's very interesting, I think, to note the Lord's words recorded in Matthew 26, verse 28, when he was passing out the grape juice there at the, the, with the disciples at the Last Supper. It's interesting what Jesus said. He said, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So, so now, rather than sprinkling blood on them externally in a ritualistic act, blood of sacrificed animals, now Jesus was encouraging his people to drink in another symbol, another ritual, to, to take internally a symbol of his sacrificed blood. And of course, the idea of sprinkling blood also reminds us of that once a year day of atonement and service when the high priest would go into the most holy place of the sanctuary, remember? And what would he do? He would sprinkle blood on that, that uh, beautiful golden cover of the Ark of the Covenant, a symbolic ritual representation of the forgiveness and cleansing from sin which had separated the people from their God. It allowed their close connection with him to be restored. 
So when Peter is talking about this here in his letter, about sprinkling the blood of Jesus Christ, he's talking about the fact that Jesus died to pay the price for the sins of all those who he had chosen from the very beginning to be saved. And yet I don't think it just stops there. The idea of sprinkling Christ's blood, I think, goes beyond just the idea of Christ's death in our place. That's huge. But I think it also means that those who are a part of God's chosen have had the value of Christ's sacrifice applied very specifically. His sacrifice applied specifically on your behalf. So that's pointing not only just to Christ's death, but also to his ongoing active ministry as the great high priest in the sanctuary in heaven. It's talking about having Jesus apply his sacrifice, his death to your personal situation, you individually. It's talking about having him apply that to your individual need and desire for salvation based on his perfect sacrifice of his perfect life. He forgives your sins. He cleanses you. And he brings you back into harmony with God. It's a very rich, it's a very rich uh, little symbol that, that Peter speaks of there, the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. So the point that Peter is stressing in 1 Peter 1 verse 2 is that our position among God's chosen people is all about God's greatness. And I, I'm sorry if I'm the one to break this to you, but you are not chosen because you are great. You're probably nice people, but you're not chosen. I'm sure you are nice people, but you're not chosen because you're great. You're chosen because God is great. That's why you're chosen, because he in love is doing great things for you, and he's doing great things in you. That's what makes you among the chosen. And notice how in describing God's great work on our behalf to allow us to be among the chosen, Peter, in this verse, if you look at it, sets out the Trinity, the three persons of the Godhead. And I think it's appropriate to maybe take a little time to consider this truth about God because it's very, very nicely outlined in this one verse of the Bible. I'm not saying it's the only verse, but in this verse, it's all contained. And we can think about that a little bit. You know, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 says, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. We have just one God. And yet the Bible teaches that this one God is made up of three separate or individual beings. And these three beings, who we call the Father, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit, they're so perfectly, harmoniously united that they're one in purpose, they're one in motives, they're, they're one in desires, one in characteristics and qualities. And... and I don't totally understand that. It's challenging for our minds to grasp this concept because there's just simply really nothing like it on earth that we can compare completely to the absolute unity of the three beings who make up this one entity of God. Sometimes there's some things about God we just, we just kind of have to accept as a part of the, the awesomeness, part of the mystery, the splendor of who our God is. And you know what? I'm actually glad about that. I'm, I'm glad that my God is greater than my understanding. Because otherwise we might... This keeps wanting to, to pull down and I'm going to have to move my mouth to my forehead. But I am glad that, I'm glad that God is greater than my, my understanding. I am glad that we have a God beyond the ability of humans to fully figure out and analyze and dissect and map, and we would probably use artificial intelligence to make a better version of him if we thought we could completely explain or presume to explain him. God is amazing, and he's revealed so much about himself, but some of it is, some of it is beyond us, and I'm glad to worship a God like that. So in 1 Peter 1, verse 2, Peter refers to the foreknowledge of God the Father, but it would have been just as correct for him to write about the foreknowledge of Jesus or the foreknowledge of the Holy Spirit because the fact is that all three members of the Godhead are equal. They all possess unlimited knowledge, and that includes knowledge of the future. Their abilities are equally shared. The point is, in everything that God does, no matter which one of the three beings might be the one who's actually taking the action, I think whatever they do, all are involved. All three are fully capable of acting 
just as capable in that setting. And I think that's why in the Bible, all three members of God are associated with the creation of this world. They are all credited with being active in creation. And I think what God's trying to help us understand is that one of the three divine beings never does something without the involvement of the other two beings. Yes, in their wisdom, the members of the Godhead choose to take different active roles in working out their plans, but the action that each one takes is always in connection with, in harmony with, the action of the other two members of the divinity. So they never work in isolation from the interest or the involvement or the approval of their fellow members of the Godhead. That's why in 2 Corinthians 5.19, it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. So if God had decided that instead of Jesus coming to this earth, taking on humanity and dying for us, if God had decided that one of one of the other two members of the Trinity would take on that role instead. You know what? Our salvation would be just as secure. It would have the same outcome. The members of the divine Trinity are perfectly united. That means they never fight. You never have one complaining that it's not fair because they're having to do too much and the others aren't pulling their weight or doing their part of the job. You never, have, you never hear one saying, well, I don't really like how you did that. I think I could have done it better than you did it. In making decisions and plans, the members of the Trinity, they never have to take a vote. You know, let's vote on it, two to one. Ha <laughs> ha, we won. It's not like that. I believe that all of God's decisions are 100% perfectly unanimous. Church board, no. We're humans, we might disagree. God, decisions are unanimous. So what does that all mean? I believe it means that our focus maybe shouldn't be so much on dividing and isolating and departmentalizing what each member of the Godhead does. Because the three beings of the Trinity, they work in concert. Rather than focusing on who's doing what among the Godhead, I think our primary focus simply needs to be on what God is doing. That would be time well spent. I don't know if you've ever been in a Sabbath school class or some discussion. Have you ever been a part of this, some discussion breaks out, some argument breaks out about which member of the Trinity was involved in some act. Oh, it was the Holy Spirit. No, it was Jesus Christ doing it. No, it was God the Father doing it. Have you ever been in those discussions? Yes? No? Maybe they never happened at College Park. And sometimes, you know what? To put it frankly, I just sit there and think, what an unproductive waste of time. Like, what on earth are we arguing about? Yeah, it's of interest to study how the various members of the Godhead work on our behalf, but the bottom line is, if one does something, they're all in it. They're all, they're all for it. it we, we have one God, so let's keep our focus on what that one God does for us. That's what's important. For me personally, when I say God, I mean, I, I mean, I think of all three beings, because I think of them as a unit. So, when I praise Jesus, if I say praise Jesus, if I sing praise Jesus, I, I'm praising the Father. I'm praising the Holy Spirit as well. When I, when I thank the Holy Spirit, I'm thanking Jesus and the Father at the same time. When I pray using one name, you know, we pray, you know, we're like, or oh, our Heavenly Father, or we say dear Jesus, or whatever we say, and I've heard people debate and fight to death about what you're supposed to say to pray, and you're not supposed to pray to the Father, you're only supposed to pray to Jesus, you're not supposed to pray to this one. What in the world? I, when I pray, I'm just, I'm just praying to God. I'm praying to all of God. In fact, if you think about it, I don't believe that it's actually possible to just communicate with one member of the Trinity. I don't think you can pray to Jesus secretly without the Father and the Holy Spirit knowing about it. Right? Can you imagine saying to the Holy Spirit, Hey, Holy Spirit, come over here. Come over here. Look, um... Listen, listen, Holy Spirit, I want to thank you for something, but if you don't mind, don't let the Father and Jesus know about this. I just want to keep this between us, right? I mean, I don't think we can do that. I don't think we can just communicate with one part of God and not the others. 1 Peter 1 verse 2 is telling us that it's thanks to the interest, the love, the effort of God. They're all there. It's the effort of God. That's why we can be chosen. It's a joint effort involving all three members of the Trinity. So realizing that we're chosen not because we're great, but rather because God is great, what should our attitude be? Our attitude should be humble thankfulness for the privilege of being counted among God's chosen. 
And when we keep that in mind, it affects how we see other people. When we remember that God chooses and calls everyone first to the same status, then we'll have no reason to look down on others who may not yet have realized or responded to God's invitation to join his family. It's an important perspective for me to keep. The person that I'm frustrated with was chosen first by God, just like I was. And that gives that person value. Then in the very last part of the verse that we've been looking at, Peter wishes his readers two things, grace and peace. And these are the blessings that are to be enjoyed by the chosen. I think the idea is that Christians, people who have responded to God's choice and call, the idea is that they will continue to grow in grace and enjoy peace so that they can always experience those blessings in a a constantly deeper and fuller sense. And I think it needs to be pointed out that it's God's place to choose first. You know, I could, I, could, I could probably look up on the website when the next city council meeting is here in Oshawa, and I could uh, arrange to go down there to the city council chambers, and I could announce to all present the good news that I have decided that effective immediately, I am now going to be a member of the, the council of Oshawa. Oh, you lucky people. And... Um, I expect that they would probably instruct me where I can go, and they would probably provide a security guard to make sure that I got there, which would probably be out, is what they should do with me. And likewise, I could announce to God, congratulations, Lord. I just want to share with you the good news that I have chosen to be a part of your family and your kingdom. And God would have every right to respond Oh, really? Well, I don't happen to be taking any applications right now. And even if I was, uh, you, you wouldn't qualify. And besides that, I don't want you. God could say that. He'd have every right to say that. Thankfully, he doesn't. But it's not about me telling God that he's got the blessing of me now being on his team. It's the blessing that God has chosen me, chosen you. It's always God who chooses first. If he didn't choose us, this is all pointless. We would have no hope in joining his team. 1 Peter 1-2 makes it clear that the initiative always begins with God. But what is amazing about God is even though he chooses us first, he never forces his choice on us. And that's really important. The initiative is God's, but he leaves it up to us to accept and cooperate with his choice of us. You see, the chosen are simply those who've accepted God's choice of them. The chosen have chosen to be the chosen, right? The chosen have chosen to accept God's choice that we can be the chosen. The chosen have chosen to be the chosen. We get to choose. Even though we've been chosen, we get to choose to accept to be chosen. It's pretty cool. So God chooses us first. But we must cooperate with his choice. We must cooperate by accepting a place in his family. 1 Peter 1-2 talks about everything God does for us so we can be among the chosen. The Holy Spirit provides the power to become sanctified or holy, but we have something to do. We have to cooperate by being submissive and allowing him to transform us. He will help us to be obedient. We have to be willing to learn to want to obey and act on that desire. On the basis of his sacrificial death for us, Jesus forgives and cleanses us But he doesn't force his forgiveness on us. We must cooperate. We must be willing to confess and repent of our sins and accept the forgiveness that he offers. So God chooses us. He does everything so we can be a part of it. But we have something to do. We we have to cooperate. And so if you're among the chosen, I would say give thanks and give the credit to God because you've simply cooperated with the initiative that he's taken to choose you and to help you to be worthy of the choice he made of you. You've been chosen by God, chosen first. Do I need to say it anymore? Is that enough? You're like, please let it be enough. I want to go home. I want to eat. But you've been chosen by God, chosen first. Why wouldn't you want to accept such a wonderful opportunity and privilege? Why wouldn't you want to accept that? You know, he was born in London, Ontario. 
on February 28, 1973, which means this coming Wednesday he's going to be 51 years old. He uh, was the first child, the eldest son of Carl and Bonnie. He's a tall guy, taller than me, six foot five. And I think his is an interesting story of not responding to being chosen first. And if you're a hockey fan, he was one of those players uh, which people tended to not be indifferent about. You know, there's some hockey players, whatever, there's some people either really like them or they tend to really hate them. I felt like he was more one of those guys. People either really liked him or they really didn't like him. And of course, for people that didn't follow hockey, couldn't care less about him. But in any case, you might have heard of this guy. His name is Eric Brian Lindros. Heard of Eric Lindros? If you're a long-term Oshawa person, you should have. Eric Lindros. So in 1989, he was 16 years old. Young guy, 16 years old. And he was the first choice overall in the Ontario Hockey League draft. Of all the people in the province and beyond, he was the number one choice. He was selected by a team called the Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds. And you might find it interesting that the Greyhounds were the major junior team that another hockey player, even if you're not a hockey fan, you might have heard of. Have you ever heard of this guy called Wayne Gretzky? Heard of him? Sault Ste. Marie Greyhounds was the team that Wayne Gretzky played for in his junior hockey. So it was good enough for Wayne, but apparently not for Mr. Lindros and his family. They didn't find the Sioux Greyhounds suitable because he refused to play for them. They drafted him number one, what a privilege, and he refused to play for them. He wouldn't do it, he, um, he wouldn't join with them, he wanted to be traded to a team closer to his home. However, the problem was the league rules were that the first round draft pick could not be traded for one year. So Sault Ste. Marie picked him, said no, I'm not going there, I'm not gonna play for you. But he couldn't be traded to anywhere else, so he went down and he played in a team called the Detroit Compuware of the North American Hockey League. Definitely not at the same level, really, as something like Major Junior, the Ontario Hockey League. He was so adamant to not play for Sault Ste. Marie that he went down to Detroit. So finally, what happened halfway through that season, the OHL, Ontario Hockey League, they actually rewrote their bylaws. They changed their bylaws specifically for Eric Lindros so that he would return and play in their league because they knew that he was a superstar. And they didn't want him playing down in Detroit in some obscurity. They wanted him in their league and that would bring in ticket sales and things like that. And so they rewrote the rules so that he could be traded in his first year. Sault Ste. Marie realized that he was never gonna come play for them so they traded him to a team you might have heard of. Have you ever heard of this team, the Oshawa Generals? Anybody heard of them? I was growing up here, I used to go and watch the Oshawa Generals games. Later on, I'd be visiting my parents in Peterborough and I'd watch some games there. And is there still a rivalry between Ottawa and Oshawa and, and Peterborough? Oh my goodness, back in the day, man, those two teams hated each other. I remember in Oshawa, there was one guy, this one guy, he had like a shirt that said like, I hate the Peterborough Peets. And he would always sit right behind there and he'd just heckle them and be just yelling at them and, and trashing them through the whole game. There was a lot of rivalry. But anyways, that's besides the point. I'm way off track. Eric Lindros got traded to the Oshawa Generals. This is what Oshawa gave up for him to Sault Ste. Marie. Three players plus three future draft picks plus $80,000. $80,000 is a lot of money to me now, but in 1990, that was a lot of money. Three players, three draft picks, 80,000 bucks. Eric Lindros was like, I'm not going to Sault Ste. Marie. I'm gonna play in Oshawa. And his choices seemed to work in his favor because you know what happened that year? His new team, the Oshawa Generals, they became the Canadian Hockey League champions. They won the 1990 Memorial Cup at the end of the season. So it seemed like Eric made a good choice, right? He ended up a champion. But it's interesting to know the rest of that story. The next year, because maybe there is justice in this world, the next year, 
Oshawa had to play, can you guess who, for the Ontario Hockey League Championship and the right to advance to the Memorial Cup Series? They ended up playing in the finals for Ontario against Sault Ste. Marie. And, you know, after I lived in Oshawa, I lived in Sault Ste. Marie, so I've lived in both of those places. And during that series, the fans and the press in Sault Ste. Marie, they had a wonderful time. They did not treat Mr. Lindros very well for his refusal, his snubbing of their team. They booed him every time he stepped on the ice. They tore him apart in the, tra in the, in the press. They called him a little baby who couldn't leave home. I mean, they just, they just destroyed him. And to make it interesting, to make it interesting, what happened was, um, ironically, the Sioux Greyhounds defeated Eric and his team from Oshawa, which was, made the people in Sault Ste. Marie so happy. You didn't want to come play for us? Well, look at you now. We just beat you. Ha, ha, ha. And the Greyhounds went on to the Memorial Cup playoffs not only that year, but the next two years. They played in the finals in 1992. They eventually won the Cup in 1993. And there are people who would say, yeah, Eric Lindros chose Oshawa. He wouldn't accept his first choice. And yeah, he won the Memorial Cup. But what if he had gone to Sault Ste. Marie? Maybe he could have won two, maybe three. Memorial Cups. That would be good enough, but his story doesn't stop there. Because again, Mr. Lindros, another time, was chosen first. This time, he was the first pick overall in the 1991 NHL entry draft. Of all the people in the world, he was chosen number one. And again, he refused to play for the team that chose him. The team that chose him, who had first choice, was the Quebec Nordiques. And he even, yeah, Raymond is still feeling the pain. So his, his rejection of their choice was so bad. If you've ever seen the drafts, if it's, if it's basketball, baseball, hockey, football, whatever, when they're, when they're chosen, they got their suit and tie on, they always put the jersey on, right? And they have them standing there in the jersey. Eric, chosen number one in the NHL draft, he refused to put on the Quebec Nordiques jersey. He wouldn't even put it on. He wouldn't even, like, take the obligatory picture. He said, no, I'm not going to play for you guys. So he didn't. He played in the Canada Cup on the Canadian national team. He spent the next season playing back junior hockey again. He was back in Oshawa, playing right here in Oshawa again. He played on the Canadian Olympic team, he played on the Canadian national junior team, but he refused to sign with the Nordiques. So the Nordiques, the Quebec Nordiques, finally gave in. And on June 30, 1992, Eric Lindros was traded to another team, to the Philadelphia Flyers. And look at what they gave up for him now. This is what Philadelphia gave in exchange for Mr. Lindros. They gave up six players. If you're old like me back in the day, some of these names will be familiar. So they traded for Eric Lindros, this little guy who wouldn't accept the team that chose him. Well, he's a big guy who wouldn't accept the team that chose him. They traded Ron Hextall, Steve Duchesne, Kerry Huffman, Mike Ricci, Peter Forsberg, and Chris Simon. Plus, they traded their first round draft picks for 1993 and 1994. Plus, they also threw in $15 million. $15 million. Here's what I think is the interesting part. The Quebec Nordiques were eventually sold and the team was moved. And does anyone know what team they became? Yeah, they became the Colorado Avalanche. And it's just so interesting, I think, that the Colorado Avalanche won the Stanley Cup in both 1996 and 2001. What about Mr. Lindros, who didn't accept to be on that team? What about him? Well, he played in the NHL from 1992 to 2007. He played for the Philadelphia Flyers. He played for the New York Rangers. And just so that he could experience, like everybody should in life, some disappointment, he played for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Uh, <laughs> The only people that I feel more sorry for than Toronto Maple Leaf fans are Buffalo Sabre fans, because they've had just as long, but they've never won. At least we can remember that our grandparents remember the Maple Leafs winning. But he played for the Maple Leafs, and he played for the Dallas Stars. 
And do you know how many Stanley Cups he won? Zero. Never won. Never won a Stanley Cup. Never got the opportunity. He is, he is considered by many people to, uh, to, to rightfully be among, you know, the greatest, some of the greatest hockey players ever. But he never won the Stanley Cup. How interesting that he chose not to play with the team that chose him first. And had he done so, he probably could have been having on his resume Stanley Cup champion, two times maybe more. But he chose not to accept their choice of him. And whatever, that's his life, it's his deal. I'm sure he's still rich and fine with some concussions. But how many people who think that they know best don't accept God's interest in them? and will miss out on the awesome inheritance that Peter goes on to describe in the next few verses if you read on in 1 Peter chapter 1. You don't have to be great. God is great. And he chose you first. That's what I want you to know. He chose you first. In fact, he put down a ridiculously huge price to earn the right to have you on his team. He didn't just throw in a few million dollars and maybe trade off some angels. He paid his own life to choose you first. This is how Ellen White said it in 1904. I'm very close to being done. But listen to what she said. I think this is very interesting. She wrote, for every human being, every human being, Christ has paid the election price. No one need be lost. All have been redeemed. To those who receive Christ as a personal savior will be given power to become the sons and daughters of God. An eternal life insurance policy has been provided for all. I like that. An eternal life insurance policy. You've been chosen. And so if you're among God's chosen people, be humbly thankful about that. And continue to grow in the grace and the peace that God has for his people. And if you haven't yet responded to God's choice and to call, I'm asking you today, will you consider that? I mean, really, consider that. Will you cooperate with his choice of you and join with him? Yeah, you can take your life into your own hands. You can figure out your own destiny. But I can assure you that God's team is going to win. If you want to be on the winning team, it's God's team. And you simply are not going to find a better offer than his choice of you. And so I encourage you to affirm that choice or to make that choice today. We're going to sing together. Before we do that, I'm just going to remind you again of something new that we're doing. Seven minutes or less. Seven minutes or less. If you're visiting with us today, if you're a guest here in this church, we want to take an opportunity to just welcome you, give you a little gift, just say hello, and greet you. We're going to do that right at the front over here, right after the service. So just uh, come up here and our, our welcome team can say hello to you. All right, let's sing together.
Heavenly Father, we want to thank you. Jesus, we want to thank you. Holy Spirit, we want to thank you for choosing us first. Thank you for honoring us with that. And may we reciprocate. May we choose you back, love you back, just as you have loved us. May that be our choice as we leave from here today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.